Fio, who was there, was coming from the office of the vice president. The cashier said, what should I write in the receipt? You should write this as a loan from Trinity Energy Limited. So the government, through the Ministry of Finance, was getting a loan of $400,000 cash. That's what I witnessed. Now we're going after the corrupt transnational networks funding and profiting from war. Real leverage for peace and human rights will come when the people who benefit from war will pay a price for the damage they cause. Well, greetings and welcome to this latest installment in this series of dialogues with whistleblowers. To kick this one off, let me just read from a press release issued on the 21st of February. The full press release can be read in the link now appearing above. It was issued by PLATH, the Platform to Protect Whistleblowers in Africa. Here's the headline. South Sudan, Malawi, oil and power leave whistleblower imprisoned, tortured and in hiding. Whistleblower busy Kiswashwa revealed a manipulation of business with hundreds of millions of dollars. Then they call for Malawian authorities to protect chartered accountant Bizdik Kiswashwa, who blew the whistle on his employer in 2018 and was subsequently charged with criminal breach of trust, imprisoned and tortured. Plaf assisted Kiswashwa, a former finance officer for South Sudanese company Trinity Energy Limited, with legal and security support and facilitated psychosocial help as he worked to reintegrate into society. It's on this report by the Sentry titled Crude Dealing, how oil-backed loans raise red flags for illegal activity in South Sudan. Now the Sentry is George Clooney's corruption-busting organization that is doing excellent work to roll back the mudslide of corruption with a special focus on Central African countries and their website explains, quote, The Century is an investigative and policy organization that seeks to disable multinational predatory networks that benefit from violent conflict, repression, and kleptocracy. Well, the Century report is an outstanding piece of work. It's concise, rigorous, factual, with full source references. I note that some 130 of the footnotes site disclosures that Bizrick made. It gives a fair right of reply for the alleged perpetrators, his intelligent analysis and the clear action steps that need to be taken by the authorities in all countries implicated to address the problems Bizrick exposed. Those who know me have heard me repeat this mantra, in life problems don't exist, only people with problems. As a compliment to the century, and to complement the wonderful report, what about the character behind it all? He is a Malawian who has, for the past three years, been working painstakingly with the Sentry investigators to ensure his revelations leave no doubt at all that sanctions need to be escalated against the predators and kleptocrats in South Sudan who have made his life a living hell for the past five years. When people with money and power have a problem. By default they will scapegoat and attack the people who have exposed the problem. Well, as will be obvious from our conversation, these are deeply corrupted elites who will stop at nothing to retaliate against anyone who stands in their way and will create as many problems as they can for the whistleblower to deter others from speaking out. People of integrity like Biswick need us to support them and stand by them. I recorded this interview with Biswick in October 2022 as part of our preparation to preempt further retaliation. We wanted to have something that was ready to quickly put out there to respond to deter any further retaliation after the release of the report. But that day has now come to pass, but ominously last Friday he was attacked but managed to escape what looked like a possible attempt to abduct him ahead of 
the release of the report and to try and intimidate the sentry from not doing so. Well, that didn't succeed. His persecutors bungled that and he's safely back in the sanctuary and out of their physical reach. But the release of the report doesn't mean that his ordeal is over. He has at last crossed the threshold in the final stage of what Joseph Campbell termed his hero's journey, the return to the familiar world. But although the world may not have changed much, Bizuk has. While he has been supported by many other whistleblowers that I work with to navigate his way back, until the villains that he has exposed have been brought to justice, he is still under threat. Well, unable to kill him physically, they are now predictably resorting to fake news to assassinate his character using smear tactics through social media instead. I normally advise whistleblowers not to waste energy in trying to refute the nonsense and instead to view such attacks simply as a proxy indicator of how truthful the disclosures actually are. Instead, I suggest they put their energy into simply telling their own story, because if something is true, it's always been true, and the truth doesn't need to be defended. It simply needs to be lived, and that's what Bazook has done. It's quite the most inspiring and remarkable story of courage and integrity that I have come across ever since the release of the Shawshank Redemption. The major difference being that Bazook's story is fact, whereas the Shawshank Redemption was fiction. Okay, so let's hear what's happened uh, five years ago when this very well-respected chartered accountant found himself sucked into the maelstrom of deceit and duplicity when he took the job as a financial manager for Trinity Energy in Juba, South Sudan. It didn't take him long to realize that their network of filling stations were in fact convenience stores not to buy bread and milk, but for trade-based money laundering and bribery. Well, Tia, so you're a teacher, clearly. Now teach me, help me understand. Where did this teaching inclination come from? And teach us about yourself. I thank you, John, for being with me here. It's my pleasure to have a person like you around me. I was born 41 years ago from parents who were primary school teachers. So teaching was in our blood, and teaching is in my blood. Uh, it is not something that I pursue, but it comes naturally, and it's my passion. I was born in 1981. My parents, who have said were primary school teachers, in fact, my father retired as a headmaster. So. We were growing up in a family where every day was about teaching. I was brought up in, a, in an environment whereby we believed that honesty, hard work, and integrity is what is very critical in somebody's life. I finished my school, my primary school, in 1995, and I was selected into uh, CCP Silver School. CCB is one of the key churches in Malawi. Uh, I went to a mission school. I moved to another public Sunday school. Because at that time, I was inspired by one of the candidates who scored very well in his final exams of Form 4. So I relocated from Blanta. So I moved from Echa Sunday school to Mulaji Sunday school. It's a public school owned by the Malawi government. I did well. In my Form 4 exams, for those to, who pass Malawi School Living Certificate of Education, MSc, the percentage rate was more than 30 percent. 30 percent, yes. Right. So I was privileged, I was one of the students who, went, who did well and succeeded in doing much of accountancy degree at the Polytechnic. Mm -hmm. uh, I finished my Bachelor of Accountancy degree in 2004. But during the period that I was in college, I was also awarded for being an outstanding student. I was awarded by the company called Continental Discount House, where they were selecting best three candidates uh, from our course and those that were studying Bachelor of Economics from uh, Chancellor College under the University of Malawi as well. So I was rewarded during my time at school for being an outstanding student. 
I, I did not struggle to get a job because I was a performing student in our, in our class. I secured a job with Deloitte, Malawi. That was way before we graduated. Uh, I graduated in 2005 after, after I was already recruited by Deloitte. Mm -hmm. I sat for my SEC exams in 2005 and 2006. I only sat for two sittings and I qualified as a chartered accountant in August 2006. I believed in hard work and the, I believe that everything is possible once you believe, once you work hard. Then in 2000 and the late 2007, I relocated to Barbados in the Caribbean under Deloitte. I joined Deloitte Barbados as an external leader up to 2011 when I came back home. When I was home here, I worked with a number of companies until I got an opportunity to work with Trinity Energy Limited in, uh, in South Sudan. It was way back in 2018, early 2018, when I got a call from my colleague. Um, we were together at the college, we were studying together, a bunch of accountants at the University of Malawi. He said, are you interested to go and work in South Sudan? I said, yes, why not? Uh, so I applied for the job. The application was addressed directly to Mr. Robert Ndeza. Uh, Robert Ndeza was the former chief executive officer of the National Oil Company of Malawi, Nogma. I was shortlisted for the interviews. We did the interviews in, in June and I was offered a job. It was a very lucrative job. My salary was $7,000 a month. I was being provided accommodation. We were provided food. I was given uh, air tickets to see my family back in Malawi. Then I left for South Sudan. But what I saw was different from what I read. Although our CEO informed us that you are going to a country different from Malawi. I did my own research as well before the interviews and I did also another research about this institution mm -hmm. uh, after the interviews. The name of the company that gave me the job is called Trinity Energy Limited. It's a local South Sudanese company that sells petroleum products owned by a South Sudanese called a call Emmanuel Ayi Matuti. And some of the shareholders in the company, Ani Kuteri. Ani Kuteri is a Kenyan, a wife to Emmanuel Ako Ayi Matuti and Richard Raja. Richard Raja is an Indian. They welcomed me, they showed me where I'm sleeping. Uh, Robert, with the Trinity, we're not only recruiting for my post. But they were also recruiting for operations manager. They recruited an operations manager, Mr. Bright Chikawanda. So there were two of us leaving Malawi to Juba to work for Trinity Energy Limited. We were staying in Kororo behind the American embassy. Uh, we started working. Trinity Energy Limited, at that time when I was there, they were selling diesel and petrol. But also, they were middle guys who were buying crude oil from the government of South East Sudan and selling it to other companies. And the company that I know that they were selling this oil, crude oil, was Glenco because I was one of the persons who were preparing invoices to Glenco. This was the business of Trinity Energy Limited. Now, in terms of the uh, diesel and petrol, they had two revenue streams. They were selling fuel at filling stations. So that is retail basis. And also, they were selling fuel on wholesale. So if you own a filling station, you could come to Trinity Energy Limited and buy a truck, which was normally 30,000 liters. And the, apart from those other customers, they were also selling the same product, petrol and diesel, to government institutions. And one of them was the South Sudan Defense Force, which was the army. They were supplying the army. But also, 
They were supplying the office of the vice president, the office of the president, even in the Ministry of Petroleum. So there was a connection, indeed a very good connection, between Trinity Energy Limited and government officials. When I reviewed the systems, the internal control environment, I found out that there are a lot of issues that have to be addressed. Then my, my strategy was to resolve short-term challenges and then implement long-term uh, strategies to ensure that the organization is running smoothly. And for you to have a, copa, a proper corporate governance structure that you can have in your organization to ensure that you've got a very good, effective financial reporting system. How can you ensure objectivity in financial reporting? By ensuring that you've got proper controls. Once the controls are effective, are well implemented in an organization, then issues of inaccuracies in financial reporting could be reduced. Everyone in the organization is aware of the transaction. Okay? I carried out an assessment during my first two weeks and I issued a report to management through the chief executive officer, Mr. Robert Indeza. And Mr. Robert Indeza had time to sit down with this report with Ako Emmanuel Ahima So we went through the report and I highlighted a number of key issues in my report. One of the critical issues was huge places of cash in filling stations, which was very shocking. So I reasoned with the chairman, the CEO, to say, I don't find it reasonable to have huge sums of money in the filling stations. And I told them, to me, this is a risky area. This gives me a red flag. So they asked me, why are you saying that? Because we don't say anything wrong with us keeping money in the filling stations, huge sums of money. I told them, number one, there are no cameras in the filling stations. Money is susceptible to theft. Employees can easily steal that money. Number two, you are in filling stations. Anything can happen. Fire. There are no proper fire extinctions in the film station. You are dealing with a pro we are dealing with a product that can easily catch fire. So we can have that money bent and lost. Thirdly, here in South East Sudan, everyone is moving with a gun. You don't know whether he's a security officer or not. So the chances of being robbed are very high. So there is no security. So they said, what are we supposed to do? They said, let us negotiate with the banks so that we can transfer all the money to the banks. Said, they said, this we're okay with that. Uh, you go ahead. There was also another area which I also highlighted in the report that uh, there should be proper accountability of the funds. Because how they were in the filling stations, what they were doing is they were issuing a, a voucher how many liters of fuel do you want? I need 10 liters. So they will issue a voucher. Once they issue a voucher to the customer, the customer will go to the filling station and he have fuel or in his motorcycle or in his car. Okay. At the end of the day, there was no reconciliation between the vouchers and the cash that was collected. Because the vouchers that have been issued and the cash that, that were collected were supposed to match. Mm. And the liters that were issued are supposed to match with the vouchers that have been issued. So those considerations were not being done. So there was no proper audit trail. Now, although they were keeping huge chunks of money in the filling stations, but there were some funds that were transferred to the bank. Now, to have an audit trail of how much funds have been transferred to the bank, there was no that correct audit trail. So someone, you couldn't trace this money that has been deposited to the bank. Where is it coming from? Which filling station is it coming from? Who took it? So everything was done without following proper procedures. So the chairman gave me a go ahead and said, okay, that's fine. Go ahead and implement all these things. But when I started implementing this, there were objections from Ali Kute. And the Richard Raja and the Indians that Richard Raja brought. Annie Kutere was a Kenyan and was bringing Kenyan people to work with her. Richard Raja was an Indian and was bringing Indians to work with him. 
Robert Ndenza was a Malawian and brought Malawians as to work with, mm. with him. We, we went with a positive intention because even when he was talking to us, he told us that, yes, I've been working there, but this company to me is not a professional company. So I want you to bring professionalism in this company. That's why the, my first step was to implement, a, to have a proper internal control system. I inquired about the policies. Do you have a human resource policy? Do you have a financial policies and procedures manual? That wasn't on the ground. So to me, the first step was to build that and have it approved by the board and we start implementing that. I went to banks. I went to Standard Bank. I went to KCB. I went to Equity. I told them we've got money in our filling stations and we want to start depositing. Uh, one of the issues that Richard Raja and Ekuteri and the, the Indians that were working there raised was that banks are not accepting South Sunday's pounds. That's why they're keeping those money in the filling station. But I personally went to the banks and talked to the banks to say, is it true that you guys don't accept money? South Sunday pounds say, no, 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 please. We, we are accepting money. So are you telling me that I can wipe all this money and bring to the banks? They said, yes. The only challenge that we have is because your money is a lot of money. What we'll do is we'll make an arrangement. You just give us an estimate amount of South Sunday's pounds that you have collected. We'll count it for you in the presence of the camera. Once you agree, those amounts will deposit that amount into the bank. I said, there is no problem. It's better for you to collect this money, count for us, and then you deposit in the bank. And my, my, my CEO was happy with this. My, the core was happy with this. But Richard Larger and Anne Kuteri were not happy with that arrangement. I didn't even understand why they are not happy with that arrangement. But I, I was a finance manager. I implemented it. I went to Kudele. all the filling stations, Kudele, uh, one in Juba, one at Bill Farm. I even bought the box, metallic boxes. And I was, I was involved in the whole process. They were even threatening me. They will shoot you. They will know that you are transferring money. I said, no, no, no. There is security here. You, the filling station of the security. And this is the security that are going to escort us to the filling station, to the, to the bank, to deposit the money. Then the system started working. But while I was wiping out all this money, I found out there were some, some dollars in the filling station. I said, where are these dollars coming from? When you guys are selling the, you are selling the fuel in the filling station, marked in pounds, how do we have the dollars here? I never had a correct answer on that one. But I said, okay, no problem. I assume that this money belongs to Trinity Energy Limited. So whether it is South Sunday's pounds, whether it's dollars, I'm wiping all this money and I'm depositing them to the bank. Fortunately, we had both uh, South Sunday's pounds bank accounts as well as dollar accounts. By doing that, I didn't know that I'm stepping mm. on the head of the snake. Mm. Not on the head, but I was stepping in the tail of the snake. <laughs> okay. I wish it was the head. <laughs> yeah. I wish I was stepping on the head because uh, it would not twist. It would be a, a very good. It would be a very good story. So I did this exercise and we made progress. And now, after that, I implemented a control. I said all the dead cells that have been done during the given day. They must be deposited the following day by nine o'clock. So anyone who is not going to do this is not in compliance with our controls. The chairman was happy. We train the people, we train the filling station managers how they can implement these controls. We design templates on how to reconcile and everything to ensure that we have got controls on the ground, we have got figures at the filling stations and everything. Some filling stations were doing the demonstrations, some filling stations are not doing the demonstrations. But I kept on pushing and pushing and pushing. But guess what? There was rejection from a number of filling stations. To me, I couldn't even understand. While we were working, there were a number of issues that were being raised. Like there was some resistance, especially from Richard Raja and 
unable to. They were resisting us, both me and the executive, the chief executive officer, as well as right at Mesidu. So they had to find issues with us. Every day there were issues. Oh, you Malawians are lazy. Oh, you Malawians were paying you a lot of money. Ah, let's review their contract. So they were finding a lot of frames excuses. And they kept us changing us from one working environment to another. They moved us from Kololo and they went, they sent us to Malakia office. Then from Malakia, we have to work in Nesitu. From Nesitu, we have to come back. You know, there was a time when our CEO left Juba and came to Malawi uh, for Tombstone and Berlin. He literally had his leave approved by the chairman, but he only spent three days and they started pushing him. Where's the CEO? But I said, why do you, why are you asking for the CEO? I thought the CEO's leave was approved by the chairman. No, he was, he's supposed to be here. You know, so there was, mm. there was that pressure, which I did not understand. Until later on, I started now realizing to say, all right, there is something wrong going on in this organization. There was a time where they were telling us to issue invoices to Glenco, mm -hmm. but you issue the invoice, and when someone here is standing, the moment we finish issuing the invoice, they take the invoice and send it without even keeping a copy in our file. Mm -hmm. That was very strange. How can you send an invoice from the finance department and you don't have a copy of the invoice? I remember I issued two invoices. They were for the value of $60 million. And Malwa, there is a guy called Malwa. Soon after issuing the invoice, he took the invoice. You know, so lots of things were happening, but for you to understand what is going on, it really took a lot of thinking for you to understand. There was a day when I was told to raise $400,000. So the chairman himself, Ako Emmanuel Ayi, my daughter, called me and said, Bizu, we need to raise $400,000. How much money do you have in the bank account? I said, we have got around $90,000. Go and withdraw that money. So I had to go and withdraw money from the bank. And then I met Malwa at the Ministry of Finance. And he, he had collected some funds, a total of $400,000. And when he went there, the cashier was refusing to collect that money. We had to go to the director of finance, Mr. Simon. And he instructed the, uh, the, 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 the cashier to say, issue, issue the receipt. I have got instructions from the minister to say that you should issue this receipt. So the guy was saying, why should I issue a receipt when the money is not coming to the Minister of Finance? Say, it is an instruction of the Minister, meaning the Minister of Finance, that you should issue a receipt, and then once you issue the receipt, and this money must go to this, we should give this individual. The individual who was there was coming from the office of the Vice President. So the cashier said, how should I write? What should I write in the receipt? Because this money is not being collected by the, by the Minister of Finance. He said, you should write this as a loan from Trinity Energy Limited. So the government, through the Minister of Finance, was getting a loan of $400,000 cash. So that's what I witnessed. How many months was this from the time you had started? You started in June, July, August, July? There were a lot of activities. There were a lot yeah. of activities that were happening. Uh, like this event of $400,000. I witnessed this one in October. It was in October, I think so. October. We were having retaliations, dissatisfactions, and this was killing us inside. And there was a night one day when uh, Robert told me to say, I want to talk to you. He said, there's this email from Anne Kuteli to say that they want to institute an audit. If they are going to find out that the trucks of fuel have been lost, they are going to kill us. That was the email 
that destroyed me. And Robert was literally crying to say, Bizwick, right now, I have no option, but I have to go back home. I will start over again. And he, in fact, he even told me to say, the chairman, Ako Emmanuel, he has called me and has told me that he does not want to find you here. Fortunately, Bright was already in Malawi. He was also on holiday. He had also a tombstone and waiting for his red wife. And he, I remember in that email, Anne Kutere said, it is good that Bright is already in Malawi and tell him that she never come back here in South East Sudan. So there are many things that are happening. But what about the external orders? I mean, doesn't, doesn't you have any scrutiny from agencies that are there to ensure accountability? They were audited before, but the audit was not completed. Uh, they were edited by Ernest and Young from Kampala, Uganda. And I remember I was assigned by the directors to meet auditors in Kampala. I went to Kampala to meet the auditors together with Swaran Pandey, who was the group finance manager. Mm -hmm. uh, we went, we had a meeting. We requested the internal audit, we requested the external auditors in Kampala to complete the audit for the previous years, but not the not 2018, 2016. They were auditing in 2013 before the war. But the response that we got from the auditors, they told us that they, was, they can comfortably do the audit starting in November, November of 2018. So we were waiting for the NSDN to come in and audit. But, surprisingly, they instituted internal auditors to audit. They outsourced internal auditors, AE Excellency, to audit the company during the period that we were on the ground. And the, I started having meetings with the internal auditors who said, no problem, uh, we were ready for the audit. Those are the auditors that I remember. Perhaps they brought you in to give the appearance that they were bringing in a competent financial professional. It's true because remember I told you that when we were being recruited, they say that we are recruiting professional people to create the professional environment in the energy industry. That's why I came with all that energy mm. to make sure that this is organization has got a sound control environment. It was my expectation that at the end of the year, we have to carry out an extensive internal audit because it's an international company. How can you have loans when you don't have audited accounts? So it seems that October 2018 was a, a threshold point. You know, you know, there's something that we need to understand on corporate governance. You know, they say that uh, if you want to create an, a proper internal control environment, it starts with the attitude of executive management. When executive management has got a political will to implement the controls, then things will be okay. If there's one member in the executive management or directors are not happy with the internal controls that you are putting there, you must know that you are in danger. Because, first of all, Director should not have integrity issues in terms of internal controls. Because if a director is using that system to benefit, or he's exercising, or she's exercising, or she's doing some fraud, then they cannot be happy with the internal control. You could see that uh, there was an unwillingness. There, there was only one person who was happy with what we were doing. But there were two people, Anne and Richard Raj, who were not happy with what we were doing. Until I realized later on that, oh, come on, these people are benefiting from this. And did you have a company secretary? There was no company secretary. Because at that time we were building up. That's why I said, I asked on human resource policy, financial and accounting procedures, manual. There was nothing on the ground. So we were developing everything then. And if you look at the intake, the qualifications of the people that they recruited, they were still so questionable. Now, let me bring to you 
to some of the key things which were happening in the company. When I joined the company, the company had a letter of credit with Afrexim Bank. The LOC was for $30 million. But this LOC that was issued by the Afrexim Bank was supposed to have a collateral. And Trinity Energy Limited got a collateral from the government of South Sudan. And guess what? What was the collateral? The collateral was the crude oil. If Trinity defaults, then the crude oil which the government allocated to Trinity should be sold and all the money must go to to office and back. Yes, that's the security. So that's when I started now realizing, okay, what is happening now? In South Sudan, the time that I was there, crude oil was supposed to be paid in advance. Okay, you buy 600,000 pounds. But the government also said, okay, all right, give us money now. It's up to you to arrange with the extractive companies because that's our oil. We we'll allocate that oil to you, we'll give that to you. But first of all, you have to give us what? You have to give us the money in advance. Guess what? When I was in ground, the government of South Sudan allocated crude oil worth 4 billion South Sudanese pounds. This was supposed to be paid in advance. But it was never paid in advance. We were paying bits by bits, bits by bits. We were collecting money from our sales of petrol and transferring that money from the bank accounts to the government of South Sudan consolidated account with the Central Bank of South Sudan. We were transferring the money from Afriland. I was personally involved in transferring the money from the banks to the government of South Sudan consolidated account. Or what I did were approvals from the chairman, the chief executive officer, the director. I was not an agent of the bank. I was neither a signatory to the bank. I never had that opportunity. My role as a finance manager was to review the records, prepare the records, and have those records properly authorized and approved. So when I was going to the bank, everyone was aware of the transactions that I was doing. And banks were confirming with the authorized signatories. So there was no transaction that I could do with the bank without the bank informing the signatories. That's impossible, right? That's the normal procedure. We were transferring funds. I would write a letter, get it to the chairman, sign it, get to the CEO, sign it, get to the tele sign it. We are transferring so much money to the Bank of South Sudan for the repayment of the loan, the four billion loan. In fact, this is the loan that was supposed to be paid in advance, but it was in paper that it should be paid in advance. But practically, which was contrary to what was agreed with the, with the South Sudanese government, which happens to the uh, oil cells. The, I don't know how they maneuver this system, but we are paying in bits and bits. It's up to the company to explain how did they manage to get an, an advance payment to turn into a loan and to pay uh, in installments. And the deadline for this loan was in November. We were supposed to, by November 2018, we were supposed to clear four billion. South Eastern response for the crude oil, which I personally signed the invoices as well. That was one of the transactions which also surprised me. And I was working hand in hand with the Minister of Finance, mm -hmm. the consigning, updating management on how much money have we paid so far on that four billion and the, uh, how much money is still outstanding. In October, we had too much pressure because there was pressure coming from the government. I knew that there were questions somewhere to say, what is happening with this 4 billion? Because this 4 billion was supposed to be paid in advance. I know that there are some eyes in the government. So there was so much pressure that we are supposed to clear this loan as fast as possible. And the, how the South Sudan market was moving, you'd find that there were a lot of dollars in the market then few South Sudanese pounds. There are certain times there are a lot of South Sudan pounds on the market and then few dollars. But most of our sales 
for the wholesale tracks, we were selling them in dollars. We were not selling them in South Sudan pounds. And at this time in October, we had a lot of dollars which we were supposed to collect from our customers. Now, a call Emmanuel Aima Dut had an arrangement with the Muhammad Ogre of Moonlight to collect dollars from us, exchange those dollars in the black market, and collect South Sudanese pounds from the black market and deposit this money into our bank accounts. I was given the responsibility to collect the, the dollars and hand it over to Muhammad Oga. Muhammad Oga was not supposed to give me any South Sudanese pounds. He was supposed to deposit the money back into the bank accounts. I was monitoring the bank accounts each and every time. So by the time that I'm releasing South Sudanese pounds, I would post check with Muhammad to say, we have received so much South Sudanese pounds. And I would arrange, collect the dollars and hand it over to him. The exchange rate was agreed by the board. So this was a black market transaction. I would collect money from the customers, issue receipt to the customers, issue a receipt to Muhammad, Muhammad Oga, and update on a daily basis, inform management directors, the chairman, informing him how much dollars have we handed over to Muhammad, how much South Sudanese pounds has been debited into our bank accounts. We had to make sure that we have raised enough funds and we are paying the government back the $4 billion yeah. from the crude oil. Okay. Now, this is the time when I started now realizing a number of transactions that were being done. One, there were bank accounts that were opened in Kenya and all the money for the crude oil was going to those bank accounts. Because we did not have enough money from our sales of petrol and diesel in South East Sudan. And at this time, some of the shippings were done and were paid for by Blanco. The company used some of the funds from these bank accounts to pay back to the 4 billion South Sudanese pounds crude oil loan. And during this period, there were a lot of funny transactions, illegal transactions that were being done. Number one, I've told you that we were getting our dollar sales, converting using the black market, and then depositing into our accounts and paying the government. There was a time where I sat down with management, with a Emmanuel, when I told him to say, I have been with banks, I talk with the banks. We can easily get our dollars. They can sell our dollars at a very good exchange rate, legally. And then we can pay the government. They said, is that possible? I said, yeah, that is possible. I went to KCB at Bulu Blanche. I sat down with even the general manager of KCB Bank, as well as the Forex people at KCB Bank. They saw my face. I had meetings with them. They were happy to sell, to buy our dollars. And they bought our dollars at a very good rate. And the chairman was very surprised to say, Bison, how did you manage to negotiate with the bank? I said, this is possible. The bank told me about this. But when I was doing this, I never knew I was also stepping on the tail of the snake. We had a problem with the bank. There was just a slight dread to say, let us raise some service of these pounds, and then we'll be able to buy these other dollars. And at that time, I think that's when they chairman negotiated with uh, Muhammad Uka to buy from the black market. I have a schedule with me which you will share, which details out how many dollars we sent to Muhammad Uka and how much South Sudanese pounds were deposited. The loan was huge. The amount of money was not enough from ourselves. What else did the company do? They still wanted to use Muhammad Uka to buy South Sudanese pounds from the black market. So they created a lot of invoices as if we have bought items outside South Sudan. So that they will send the dollars to that company. And in that company, like we are making a payment for an import in dollars. 
So that person will receive dollars and will take the dollars and deposit to our bank, bank account. So there were a number of invoices which were created to facilitate that transaction. And those transactions were done by Suwaran Pande in Kenya because he was a good finance manager, working hand in hand with Ako, Emmanuel Ayi and Muhammad Oka. There were instances whereby I was literally told by Suwaran Pande to tell me to say, Bizwig, there is no way you can do business in South Sudan without corrupting government officials. That's why we request for business acquisitions, money. Because there were requests to my office on transactions that do not make any sense. Can you prepare 10 million dollars? Can you please prepare 10 million South Sudan pounds for business acquisition? I have letters with me which were written requesting money for business acquisition. When you ask them, what is the just, why don't we have proper records supporting this? They never provided that information. That money was being paid to, to government officials. There was a time when Richard Raja was going to New York to submit a bid to supply oil for United Nations in South Sudan. They requested for 25,000 US dollars cash. And I said, your ticket is being paid by the company. You are going to New York only for a week. Why do you need $25,000? I received an email from Swalan Pande, an Indian, who is also related to Richard Larger, saying, why are you asking for the director's expenses? I told them, at the end of the day, it's me who will be answering. Because there are some other transactions that, by the look of the eye, it raises some discomfort to the auditors to say, someone is traveling to New York to bid for a tender of supply of oil, and this person is staying in New York for one week, and he, everything has been paid for, but he's traveling with 25,000 US dollars hard cash. What is it for? I have to answer, and this is the right time for me to have answers. I cannot have answers when I'm being audited. This is the right time to have answers. I didn't know that when I was saying all those things, I was stepping on the tells of a cobra. Mm. <laughs> there was a time when I was asked to go to the bank and withdraw $15,000. I went and withdraw $15,000 after approvals. And then he himself, I call Emmanuel Ayi, told me that he uh, leave the money with us here. He was with Malwar Pande so that we'll make an arrangement for the payment. We want to pay these government officials who are going to Kenya for a trade fair. I said, no, no, it's high time now. I need to know this. I'm the one that was given the responsibility the finance. I need to see these people that you pay. And if possible, I want, I want them to sign. Because my understanding is, when you are paying government officials for an activity that they're doing for the company, they have to sign. So Ako was laughing, he said, okay, no problem you make an arrangement. So I put money in the envelopes, I went into the boardroom, I paid a number of government officials. Unfortunately, they wouldn't sign, and I couldn't force them to sign. <laughs> but the trade fair wasn't done. And I remember even an official from the Bank of South Sudan coming to my office in Malakia, collecting money that was remaining in the envelope. I have a vivid face of that individual. Unfortunately, I must admit that I couldn't memorize the names of these individuals. But the team, everyone was aware of what is. These are just some of the minor transactions that were being done. But there were millions and millions of South Sudanese pounds that were withdrawn from Afriland Bank, withdrawn from KCB Bank, withdrawn from Equity Bank, which were being given to the government officials. Mm -hmm. There were money that were being collected from the filling stations. Now this is the time when I understood that they did not want an audit trail. They had to keep a lot of money in the filling stations. And then they can easily just go to the filling station, take 10 million South Africa pounds, put in a sack, and they hand it over to the government officials. So when did you become aware that this was a cobra and that it was poisonous? <laughs> It makes sense from what you're saying. You go for the job with high expectations, you want to be professional, and you're realizing that, hey, they're wanting me as window dressing, 
because behind the scenes there is something happening which you can't live with. What happened thereafter? I realized that things are not going well soon after rejections from other members of the board. It was one of the key things that I proposed in the internal controls and said, let us have cameras in the filling stations so that we can trace, we can have even evidence of how our fans are moving. She literally rejected. We cannot put these controls. These controls are very expensive. A camera is not expensive. <laughs> so I realized, oh, something is wrong. So they had to, she was making sure that there was sabotage on the ground. She was mobilizing people in the feeding stations, which she recruited to not accept the controls that were putting in. That's when I realized that something is wrong. And guess what? When we were having, we have, we're not having some challenges in getting the dollars from Muhammad, in getting the dollars to Muhammad and Muhammad is sending the money to the banks, she stood up and said, I told you, I told you Muhammad cannot do this business. Then I realized, okay, she was the one who was operating the banks in the filling station. Because she had a lot of service on his pounds, she was controlling the filling stations, she was able to buy and sell dollars using the funds that were in the film stations. So when I wiped out all the money from the film station, that's when I stepped on the, that was the first step on the program. Mm -hmm. Now, this week has wiped out all the money from the mm -hmm. film stations. Where am I going to get the money? Mm -hmm. So they, so they had repurposed filling stations to be places where people fill up the bank account. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so it was a convenience store for for money laundering. Yes. <laughs> for them, you know, you would be shocked because even the dollars that are collected from the filling stations, the, the filling stations were the overnight banks mm. to facilitate illegal black market exchange. Mm. Okay. So I was putting controls that were damaging their business. Because it was huge, they were in sacks. Huge sacks. Millions and millions of sorts of surveillance pounds, which was very strange. Well, I'm never going to be able to go and fill my car with petrol at a filling station again <laughs> and not think about your story. <laughs> and I'm going to be looking to see if there are cameras and everything else. <laughs> and were you getting support from anyone else in the system? You know, our chief executive officer was very timid. They were threatening him. Was, your fellow Malawian. Yes, my fellow Malawian. They were so timid. They, I mean, I don't know, maybe I've got that because I've worked as an auditor and the, working as an external auditor, you issue a lot of recommendations to management. And you've got to be assertive. Yes. Be pushed yes. Down. Because auditing teaches us to do what is right and to recommend what is right. And to, in fact, blow the whistle. Yes. Yeah, yes. You're if there is something wrong, that's why when you do external auditing, there's always what you call management later. And in that management letter, you highlight fraud, mm. weaknesses. If even if the internal control is there, but if the internal control is weak, you highlight that. And you have qualifications. Yes. Too. And you, you, you inform them and you advise what is the risk that is associated with the weakness that you have identified. Mm. And then you make a recommendation. And then you give them a timeline for implementation. And when you are doing your next audit, you also have to check. Mm. We gave you the following recommendations. Have we implemented them? Okay, and then if it is necessary for you to issue other issues, then you add to the areas which have not yet been implemented. So, like myself, I made recommendations, I put timelines, because it would give me comfort. If transactions are moving anyhow, how am I going to report for those transactions to the auditors? At the end of the day, to be the same directors who come back to me to say, this week you're not doing your work, dear, you're not doing your work. So the onus was on me to be as prudent as possible to make sure that we have improper control. Transactions are recorded.
Mm. We, I wasn't happy with how the CEO was because he was very timid. There was even a time when I told him, I've sat down with Ako Emmanuel Ai, the chairman. I've told him that all the payments that were being done in the name of business acquisition, mm. the beneficiaries should be able to sign. And he said, please, well, how have you done that? I said, I even reached a point where I told our court to say, if you think I'm lying, I'm not saying the truth about signatures of government officials. If you have got any government official here in South Sudan, please invite him and let's have a meeting. A co invited a senior procurement government official. We sat down and he told a co to say, if we are working for a private company, if we've got an assignment for the private company, all the allowances that are paid by the private company are supposed to be signed for. And we have got a change which highlights how much is supposed to be given as a day allowance to a given individual at a given grade. The change was there in the government. And secondly, if we were, all of us are not around, the leader of delegation is the one who signs on behalf of everybody. So could you, see, you could see there is someone who would come and tell, say, okay, we need $15,000, we have to pay for government officials. They are doing this assignment, ABC, and there is no signature. How do you know that the whole $15,000 has been paid to the government officials? What I'm hearing you say, which is interesting, as a social worker, I'm listening to what you're saying, but I'm listening to what is a deeper heart to you. And what I'm hearing you say is that at last I've now got an opportunity to explain what was happening to me because there was no one that you had alongside you at the time who could really be in any way in solidarity with you. Is that, is that an accurate observation? What a question. I've had discussions with a number of institutions mm. who are also investigating on corruption issues in South Sudan. One of them is the Centre. I've also had discussions with Bluff to discuss on this issue. But this is the time when I've been able to express fully to what has been going on uh, in my life and what I experienced in South Sudan. I was expecting to have a candid discussion with the Minister of Foreign Affairs because there are a lot of issues that were happening, but there was they have been ignoring me. I thought I'll have an opportunity also to discuss with the media here in Malawi, but they have been ignoring me. My brother and I made efforts to talk to the Malawi Human Rights Commission on the same issue but we never had any audience like the audience that we're having right now. The reason I'm framing it like this is because I my interest in this matter is I've heard the stories of many whistleblowers now, and I'm just seeing a, a similarity. And what I keep going back to, and I say, in life there are no such thing as problems. Problems don't exist. Only people with problems. And so often we lose sight of the human, uh, psychological, emotional impact that this is having on you because your problem isn't solved, <laughs> you know. I just want to ensure that people like you are not left on the margins because we need a lot more people like you. There are so many potential people like you, and they're not going to want to actually come forward if they're going to be, feel like they're a voice crying alone in the wilderness. The honest response to a person, as I have found working with whistleblowers, when they say they've got a problem, I've had to now be honest with them and say, yes, don't worry, it's only going to get worse. How did things get worse? Tell us now from what happened yeah. when you booked your flight to Dar es Salaam. Yes. So I made a decision to say, okay, all right, we left Malawi. I don't think our embassy is aware of our movement. Let me go to Dar es Salaam and report what has been going on here. 
and come back. Because if I report to the embers, at least I have given them the information. They know that our citizens are working in an institution that is very corrupt. So I decided to leave on the 20th of October 2018, heading to Dar es Salaam. In the next installments, Bizik will tell us what then happened. Subscribe to my channel, ring the bell, so you will get notification when it's up. If you can't wait, I have uploaded a synopsis of the whole story up on my Medium platform. That link should also now be appearing somewhere above. I just want to close with two final reflections. Even though the story is only breaking now in the public domain, ever since I returned from Malawi in October, I have been encouraging other whistleblowers not to give up, inspired by what Biswick has shared. That even if things do get worse, their resilience will come from having owned their story, even the bits that, that may embarrass them. We will be resilient if we find deeply satisfying ways to ensure we are not impoverished in our fundamental human needs. And I find it helpful to use this wheel of fundamental human needs as a kind of a diagnostic guide to to help clients to take stock of just how well satisfied their needs are in each of the spokes and how much of a sense of holistic integration they are experiencing. For a more detailed elaboration on that approach, the video link which now appears elaborates on it. It's known as the Human Scale Development Approach and I explain it in the context of a conversation I had a few years ago with a friend, Sabu Zagode, the founder of the amazing community movement known as Abasali Basanjondolo. Now they've survived assassinations, attacks, which have been relentless over the years, but somehow they just keep going and growing. And the point is, if our needs are not satisfied, we will leave ourselves open to being jerked around, co-opted and captured. If our needs are well satisfied, we will be able to keep moving. We will be resilient and we will prevail. I just love that metaphor. But many human scale development practitioners add a tenth need, transcendence, to make it more than just psychosocial, to also include a spiritual transcendent dimension, which is actually pivotal in my experience. Now this is not only just born out from talking to whistleblowers, but I've also had the opportunity to develop relationships with some people who were on the other side, who were, in a sense, seduced into the conspiracies of corruption or blinded by their own prejudice and biases, allowed themselves to be sucked into that orbit, but then have now come to their proper senses. And it's quite clear that they were susceptible to being played because of an unbalanced wheel because they were in need of some sort of satisfaction of those needs, but then resorted to false and at times really destructive ways of doing so. That is why it is so important that whistleblowers get expert psychosocial support, a organic process of solidarity and support emerging from amongst whistleblowers. And I have, I'm pleased to say, in the group that I've been working with, found like it's a new force of nature that's arisen because of that. So it's not just money from the top and state intervention, all this. that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And I just hope and pray that this story will be a catalyst to further mobilize that. The second point I wanted to just quickly dwell on, it connects the crude dealings in South Sudan with the work I have been doing in South Africa for past couple of decades, which is to challenge social and environmental injustice in the mining industry. One thing it leapt out from the Century Report was this quote, South Sudan's crude oil is exceptionally precious at production levels of around 170,000 barrels per day. The country's known oil reserves will last just 13 years, according to the Ministry of Petroleum. Well, what then? Oil is the only resource they really have to keep their economy going. They are going to squander it and leave future generations impoverished. 
we need to bear in mind that oil and minerals are non-renewable natural resources and if we're going to take them from the earth's crust at the very least we must be conscious of the reality that we are effectively borrowing them from future generations so that they optimize benefits for all rather than maximize profits for a few and the story of what Biswick told me is another terrible illustration of how that has been about profit maximization regardless of the consequences. This is a lot more serious than simply about exposing individual human rights violations to reluctant authorities. It is about how we can find a mutually beneficial relationship between the human species and the planet Earth. So, I hope that Akwo Emmanuel Ayi Madut and Kutere Retere, Richard Raja and their corrupting partners in South Sudan and Rwanda and elsewhere get to see this video and honestly ask themselves what will your children and grandchildren say about what you have done.